Oh my goodness, there's a lot going on in the life of the church. We have a scripture this week from the Gospel of John that follows on directly from where we left off last week. Last week we were talking about God, the vine keeper, Jesus, the good vine, all of Jesus' I am statements, I am the good vine, and us as the branches. Um, in truth, one of the things that I was thinking about this week as, as this scripture is kind of going on and on and as our liturgical calendar cut the scripture up into two weeks, so we're preaching on the same thing kind of two weeks in a row, have you ever been listening to someone and they just keep going on and on and you want to say, I got it already? I kind of feel like maybe the disciples were thinking that as Jesus is going on and on. I'm the vine, I'm the good vine, God's the vine keeper, you're the branches. On and on he goes. So we get a little bit more of that. Sometimes this passage is one that we read on Monday, Thursday. It is a passage that comes to us on Holy Week, and with good reason. This passage, as it tacks on and connects with the vine and the branches and us, is our new commandment. It is a commandment for how we live. Um, this passage in and of itself is Jesus in Holy Week, we read it to know how Holy Week resets human history, and we read it now as Jesus' personal reorientation to how we live. What does it mean about how we are set as disciples going out in the world? We're still in the Easter season, so it is still Jesus revealed to us, still calling us out. In a couple weeks, we are going to remember Jesus' ascension. He's going to go back to heaven or where God is, and then we are going to be on our own. But for now, we get this training from Jesus that continues. Within this passage, we talk about love in addition to commandments. I think when we talk about love in the church, love in worship, people can get a little bit tuned out. Sometimes we talk about love and it feels a little bit vanilla, maybe hallmark, sappy kind of cards love, but I don't want you to become numb to the power and the proclamation of Jesus in this scripture that is defining our work through love. It is a commandment to abide and to love. How do we orient as people of Christ, as people called out into the world, all that we do, Christ tells us, vine keeper, good vine, branches, is to go out and love one another. Okay, you will uh, remember this passage well. It will sound familiar to you. So let us hear it now. Let me invite our wonderful uh, liturgists to come on down front. Uh, we are hearing today from John chapter 15. Thank you. Today is John chapter 15, verses 9 through 17, from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. <clears throat> As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Word of God for the people of God. <clears throat> 
I think I'm going to make my little confessional now. So I was working on this uh, message for you and with us and conversation uh, as it is. And at the same time, all week long, all, all two weeks, I've been sort of watching General Conference. I don't know if any of you saw that. Uh, so at one point, I was working on the message, working on worship. I had General Conference on my iPad, and I had the news with some trials and other things going on on my computer as, with both on, sounds on as I was working on the sermon. So um, I, I, just a message of confession so that you know. <laughs> You never do that kind of thing, do you? No. We call that multitasking, right? I'm not sure that's a good thing, but that's where we are. Um, in truth, I, I also say that to suggest that there is just a lot going on. Um, there's a lot to distract us. There's a lot of things happening, and there's a lot to take in that, that we are trying to make sense of. Um, and, and my prayer is that when we come to worship, uh, worship is a time of resetting our heart, of centering in for the time that we are here that doesn't make us add to our sense of chaos about the world, but reminds us that we belong to one another. No matter where you are or how you come or whether you're here in sanctuary or home in your sanctuary, that this is a time that resets your heart. With this passage, it resets us all toward love. There is a King quote that I just want to start with. It is Martin Luther King, 1957, a few years ago. Um, he said, love is creative and redemptive. Love builds up and unites. Hair, hate tears down and destroy, destroys. The aftermath of the fight fire with fire method is bitterness and chaos. The aftermath of the love method is reconciliation and creation of the beloved community. Physical force can repress, restrain, coerce, destroy, but it cannot create and organize anything permanent. Only love can do that. Yes, love, which means understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill, even for one's enemies, is the solution to the race problem. As I read this and read this this week as I was praying on our scripture, love is the answer to many of our problems and how we relate to each other in this world. I love how King suggests and reminds us, physical force can only hold back. It cannot change your heart or create anything permanent. I remember a, a friend posting a, a different Martin Luther King quote on her Facebook page, um, thinking that it would engender some like sort of warm, fuzzy encouragement, that it would be just a... Uh, uh, yeah, everybody would agree with that and feel comforted and happy. But after posting it on her page, there was a whole litany of people who were angry that she posted it and started inciting uh, words of cruelty and um, meanness. She posted this. I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. Can you imagine posting that, sharing that, setting that as your focus, and having people come back at you in anger? Now, to be fair, maybe, it was 2017, so a whole bunch of years ago. But it makes me wonder, are we living in a time when love is controversial? Are we living in a time when it seems like hate, violence, inciting cruelty might be a reasonable expression of, I don't know, what you think of the other person? Are we living in a moment of sin or a season of sin or a, a point where we are making a decision about who we want to be? 
how is it that we are living in a world when hurting another person seems like an option or a consideration? Now, my very, very cynical Gen X heart has an answer to this, and I hope that I'm wrong. I hope that who we are is a people who are returning to love, that we have passed through a moment of division and dissension, maybe, or maybe we are just learning a better way of caring for one another. I pray that we have courage to hear Jesus' commandment, that love means moving beyond that Hallmark greeting card or maybe even a warm, fuzzy post on our Facebook pages or wherever, whatever, however you spread whatever you think. I hope we are a people who understand the bold muscles of love that Jesus is relating to as a means of not just interacting one-on-one, -on -one, but transforming a world. Transforming a world from individual tribes or places, one and two people, and moving into something that is more a kingdom, a kingdom, God's place. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. It is a flat-out, <laughs> undramatic kind of statement. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. To abide is to live there. To abide is to create your residence in love. Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus says he keeps God's commandments, and so should we. It is the continuation of this passage that helps us to understand the relationship between God, Jesus, and us. It is this interconnection that we keep moving through. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Last week, we reflected on God, the vine keeper, Jesus, the good vine, and us, us, the branches. Abide in love. Move out from there. Being faithful, being disciples, who we are, it is about relationship, connection, and how we discern how to apply love to life. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus is clearly not saying, judge one another as I have judged you. He is not saying, correct one another as I have come down to correct you. That's a little meddling. I'm sorry, I'll pull that one back. The commandment is to love. I wonder if Jesus thought loving one another was so clear it was just obvious. Maybe Jesus thought saying agape, love, was just simple and clear. But it is hard to live out. What does it mean to love one another? You are my friends, Jesus says, not my servants not my servants. It is an important place where this scripture turns a little bit. The difference between choosing a person and being in a mutual relationship versus being obligated to act for someone else is the difference between friendship and servitude. A servant is obligated and constrained, but a friend, a friend, a friend shares their life, lives out in mutuality all that they are, and even gives their life sacrifices their life, maybe time, maybe space, maybe money, maybe whatever, for a friend. A friend shows up, sits with, holds on. So we did have general conference this week, and I just want to bring you up to date or uh, share a little bit about that with you. Uh, it is not without controversy, but, you know, the Methodist Church has been with controversy for a long time now. So general conference. And as I share the information of this, I want to uh, invite us to stay in an attitude of worship. 
hold on to the attitude of worship and, and listen, receive, hear, engage in a prayerful way. General Conference of our denomination is the only body of our church that can change our rules, our order, our um, process. And it, it is not a uh, mysterious kind of thing. It is a very large committee of people who get together from across the globe. They were elected from each annual conference, each region, each area. They come together, and, and typically they come together every four years. Uh, the general conference that happened this last two weeks was the postponed general conference from 2020. Uh, because not everybody could get uh, to the conference because of COVID. So this is that annual conference that was postponed. They'll have the, I know, we're Methodists, so we do everything just a little bit like this. We'll have the 2024 annual uh, general conference later, um, not in 2024. I think next year in 2025. If you can keep track of that, congratulations. Um, but it is the general conference, two weeks, of people across the globe, one committee doing the work of ministry, doing the work of worshiping with one another, growing these relationships in faith throughout the entire globe, often living out what it is to be a witness as to Jesus Christ. Um, and the way some people have explained what happened this week is by referring to it as the three R's the three R's. Um, it's going to take a while in truth for all of us to understand it. And even though I was uh, nerding out and watching General Conference online, there was just a lot. It is a, a fire hose of experience, expression, and adaptation in our denomination that will take time for us to understand. And there are always gaps in how we understand things, and then we come back and uh, rehab them. We've been doing that for a long time. Um, the United Methodist Church came into being in 1968. Uh, two churches coming together, the United Brethren and uh, the Methodist, and so we got united from the Evangelical Brethren and Methodist from Methodist and became United Methodist. Um, in 1972, that was the first general conference after that first one, and they adapted again, and I'll circle back to that in a minute. But with this general conference, the three R's are what people are referring to. Regionalization, regionalization, it is what it sounds like, by the way, uh, removing restrictive language, and revised social principles. These are three big sweeping things that happened at this general conference. Um, retired Bishop Grant Hagia names them in a way I'm going to share with you in a minute. Uh, he sent a letter out this week and talked more specifically to what he thinks. One of the things uh, and the reasons I mention him, he explains this general conference feeling like uh, for the last, I don't know, 20 years maybe, the church has been held up in a log jam. Um, struggling with who we wanted to be in our theological conversation and really living at odds with one another. Uh, if you've been following, the church has just gotten more and more conflicted and challenged, and this general conference, for many who were there, feels like a breaking up of that logjam experience. So Bishop Grant Hagia uh, expresses what happened at the general conference kind of more fulsomely um, with these four pieces. He says, we have removed all exclusive language about our LGBTQIA siblings for ordination and marriage, and most importantly, the incompatibility language with Christian teaching. We have also approved a regionalization proposal a move which will, that will redefine the United States as a region along with other central conferences outside the United States. This significantly, he says, this significant change will require ratification 
from every annual conference in the denomination, a process that usually takes a year to complete. Um, that particular thing is like adding uh, another rule to the Bill of Rights or the Constitution of the United States. They can make the change, but all the ancillary parts of the church, all the bodies have to also agree. So that's why that will take a little bit more time. Uh, he says, we have adopted a new revised social principles which cement our new identity as a socially progressive denomination that unconditionally accepts all people through the grace of God in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. The revised social principles, they are online if you want to look them up. Uh, I preached on them a couple weeks ago when I talked about um, Earth Sunday, Earth Day. And there's a lot of that language in there. And he said the last one was, we rejected the traditional call to continue the disaffiliation process, which ended before general conference began. As you uh, may know, we've been in this process with the conflict, and um, there was a way made for churches who could not abide by who we were becoming or the challenges or the argument to uh, disaffiliate and leave. Uh, a new denomination was begun. This week, the United Methodist Church, our denomination, made literal news. It is amazing. Uh, the United Methodist Church hasn't made the, the news like online and anywhere else for, I don't know, decades now. <laughs> but somehow, if you turned on the TV this week, you may have seen interviews with bishops and other leadership um, talking about the removal of language that excluded LGBTQIA persons from a variety of roles and from access to a variety of experiences in our denomination. It is really difficult to explain the consequential changes made this week. It is really profound. Um, there was language added, it was in 1972, and that language has been a source of conflict in our church ever since. Um, I think we cannot know the impact to what it is to be a people relative to those that work this last two weeks right now. Um, it, is, it is going to be a time of living into it. What does it mean? How do we apply it? How does that work? Do we truly, are we truly a people with, who have made an identity shift? Um, how is that going to, to communicate to people who may be longing to love Jesus or curious about Christian faith and uh, wonder who we are? Um, will some people be able to know God more fully based on the work that we did? Or maybe some people will be driven away. We just don't know yet. The hope, I think, my hope that comes from the work done is that we can find a space where we talk to one another. We find a space where we relate to one another. Even as I'm overjoyed about the work that happened at General Conference, I recognize and know that there are many who are not and that we are all a part of God's good care, beloved of God. That matters. There is this way in which Jesus says, abide with love, abide with me, my commandment is to love. And that has, in my heart, and the way I read the scriptures and share them with you, has to be our baseline. What does it mean to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ? John 15 calls us to connect, abide, and love. In the 37 times that Jesus describes the reign of God in the Gospels, in the 37 times when Jesus describes what it is to be God, have God in charge of everything, not once does Jesus talk about the kingdom of God in the way that we might think about the kingdom of earth. Not once does Jesus talk about hierarchy and kind of like overviews and that kind of thing. Jesus talks about lamps and debt. He talks about a friend in the night. He talks about being the sower of seeds. He talks about wine and nets and pearls and weeds and treasure. 
What is the kingdom of God like? It is like leavening. It is like the two sons. Do you remember the two sons with a father? The younger son. The kingdom of God is like the bridesmaids and the sheep and the workers and the judges. Jesus challenges us beyond this world. He challenges us beyond the hierarchy, beyond the violence, beyond the hate, beyond the ruling power, beyond those who take advantage of the weak or the poor and crush one another and are angry all the time. Jesus challenges us beyond a time of unwelcome to a time of radical welcome, to welcome even, even the stranger. It is a profound statement to even welcome the stranger somebody that you have no concept of what they're bringing to the party. Kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, God with us. I close today with a, a poem that I read online uh, this week as general conference closed. It is called Home by Another Road. It is by Mark Miller and Linda, Lindy uh, Thompson. Um, and it is a call, it is a claiming of living out faith by not going to where we were before but to become another people not going back to that moment of hate and conflict and division and and just the log jam of stress but to go to the place where love defines who we are and how we treat one another and how we give space for one another to seek and live out the scriptures home by another road you taught my heart what love can be, so I'm headed back home by another road. I was once bound, but now I'm free, so I'm headed back home by another road. The lights are on and the welcome warm as we're headed back home by another ro road. There's a room for every person born as we're headed back home by another road. Join me now, the road is wide. All God's children side by side, where justice will shine and love abide. We're headed back home by another road. Yes, we're headed back home by another road. God's people on the move again, and we're headed back home by another road. The power of love has made us kin, and we're headed back home by another road. Still worshiping, we're on the way, and we're headed back home by another road. We'll hold each other's hearts this day as we're headed back home by another road. May we be people who leave the past and claim the future and abide still now and always in God's love. May it be so. Amen.